Hello. Our story begins inside the second Death Star, in the middle of a confrontation between father and son. Vader was initially going easy on his son, but soon found it to even be a difficult task. Luke was trained well, and he was talented. And if Vader played around too much, it could cost him. It helped Luke land a blow on his shoulder during their encounter on Cloud City. Sidious sat on his throne, enjoying the confrontation, hoping that his apprentice could be replaced. It was the same dynamic he had with Dooku at one point. Vader by now was a means to an end. Luke would be a much better fit for his future, so why not take advantage of him? Kill off Vader and begin anew with the Son of the Dark Lord. While their battle was going on, the two of them got separated. Vader was able to use the Force to sense Luke's fears. One of the consistent weaknesses was his inability to stop fear from controlling him. Once he felt the fear of losing loved ones and so forth, he was inconsolable. It's how he ended up leaving Dagobah for Bespin, and it's exactly how Vader would exploit him here, with the mention of his twin sister. It was a moment of pure rage. Luke plunged forward, he began to blast away at his father trying to kill him. Vader knew this would come and anticipated it. If Luke was anything like Anakin, then he'd be reckless and begin to fight aggressively. Being that Vader saw this move coming from yesterday, he got on the defensive. Luke's reckless strikes and aggressive moves had him over swinging and beating his lightsaber against Vader's like a bat. Part of Vader chuckled at the lack of finesse and swagger that Luke had. He was a superior fighter when he was at his son's age, but the Clone Wars did help him with such superiority in lightsaber combat. Vader led his son up the steps of the throne room so they could continue the fight against each other in front of the Dark Lord. If his son couldn't be turned to the dark side, then Vader would have to take control for himself. He wouldn't weaken himself to the light ever again, it'd be a fool's decision to do that. He would relinquish years of dedication and practice to a craft that allowed him to be so powerful as he was now. Without the dark side he was nothing, and he knew it. Luke continued his angry barrage, as if the only thing he could see was rage and anger seething from his own soul. He couldn't escape it, he couldn't deny it. Vader let it play out some more, and more, until he saw Sidious rise from his throne with a hideous little cackle under his breath. Vader blasted Luke's lightsaber away from him, and the Jedi looked confused and defeated. The rage that set in his eyes washed out and his skin became pale, almost like he knew he would suffer now. Before he could say a word or react, he heard Sidious catch the blade and then release a barrage of lightning. Maybe he was disappointed, maybe he was flustered, but Sidious could not believe that Vader managed to get himself out of this one too. Maybe Sidious put too much faith in the boy instead of his long-time apprentice. No matter, as long as one of them continued to aid him in his empire, then it didn't matter. Sidious stopped and told Luke that he had so many opportunities to take Vader's spot at his side. Luke shook his head. He expressed that he was a Jedi, and before he could finish his sentiment, Sidious interrupted him, claiming that the Jedi were dead. They would never return. He felt it. Yoda was gone, and with him, their religion was extinct. Luke shook his head, preparing to say something, but he couldn't. He was electrocuted again, and so he began to beg for his father's assistance in this. If Vader could save him, then they could restore the balance. Vader looked down, almost in pity. If only Luke had taken his side on Cloud City. The Emperor pridefully electrocuted young Skywalker and his cries of agony echoed out across the chambers. Sidious was so prideful of this that while he was taking pride in extinguishing the final Jedi, he never had a chance to hear Vader move his metallic arm up the Sidious' head and ignite the weapon. The Dark Lord in moments dropped to the ground dead. Luke looked up in excitement before his joy faded. Vader held out his hand and told his son to join him or die. Luke pleaded, suggesting that there was good in him, and before he could finish another round of sentiment about how there was good in Vader, his life was extinguished. Vader left the room, two dead bodies left behind. If the station fell, then he would become the new Emperor, not like he wasn't already. But Vader could feel a disturbance. He knew that the shield generator was down on the surface. He needed to get to the reactor shaft immediately. He couldn't believe the Empire would be so unwise after the failure of the first one. It's not like they had Galen Ursa to blame for this one. Vader, on his way to the reactor shaft, told the crew to load up their largest blast and target the Rebel flagship. The commander informed him that the Executor was sitting in the way, and Vader explained that he did not care for Piet. If he wanted to live, then he would fire on the Executor and the Rebel flagship. Within moments, the Executor and Home One were obliterated. This would have the second Death Star saved from having the massive Star Destroyer crash into it. However, many Imperial vessels feared that the Rebels had taken control over the super weapon. It would be brushed off as a misfire that ended up hitting the intended target anyways. It was also not like the Executor didn't survive. It was just split down the middle with thousands of crew members sucked into space and dozens of airlocks being created. They could send rescue crews out to retrieve them. Home 1, on the other hand, didn't share the same fate. The ship was blasted from the bridge inwards and gone within moments. Lando had to take control of the Rebel fleet because if he didn't, it would fall in on itself. He expressed that the Allies needed to move quickly to destroy the super weapon. He told the fleet to disperse further into Imperial lines as a wing of his allies bursted into the reactor shaft. 
A wing of TIE fighters intercepted them. As they were running a chase into the reactor shaft, Lando maneuvered to perfection. The TIEs behind them were all of a sudden blown out of the sky. Oh, it had to be the rebel reinforcements. It wasn't. Lord Vader's personal TIE fighter barreled in after them. He knew the TIE pilots weren't going to get the job done. He ripped the ship through and blasted down a Y-wing and a B-wing before they could split off. Lando told Wedge to go to the opposite route. He would head down the reactor shaft. As Wedge split off, Vader spun his ship around, locking the engines in and twisting the vessel ever so slightly, releasing a barrage of blaster bolts, ripping apart the engines on the X-wing, killing the former Imperial pilot immediately. Vader switched the engines back on after completing a full 360 for dramatic effect. The Dark Lord readied all of his torpedoes and had them target different places on the Millennium Falcon before releasing six of them. As they released, his TIE fighter opened fire. The shields on the Falcon were strong. They survived a couple of hits from his Star Destroyer at once, which is exactly why Vader had different ports on the ship targeted. The bottom and top cannons were obliterated. The midsection of the ship was blasted once more. The landing gears were hit once, with a stray torpedo landing on the top of the cockpit, which rattled Lando enough for the ship to dip down into a groove of construction pieces, ripping through them. This did exactly what Vader wanted. It completely ruined the shields, not to mention his consistent barrage on their aft. He pulled up his last four torpedoes and launched them, each of them landing a direct hit amongst the rounds of blaster fire. The Falcon obliterated into a million pieces, just as Lando laid his eyes on the reactor shaft. The Rebels all died instantaneously, and the legacy of the Millennium Falcon perished. Outside, the radio silence from the Rebels informed them that Lando had failed. The Alliance needed to retreat. Captain Holdo of the Alliance fleet took her blockade runner down to the surface of Endor to retrieve Leia, Han, Chewie, Rex, and the rest of the surviving rebels. The Empire won the day, and while they may have lost the shield generator, it didn't matter. Palpatine's risk almost cost the Empire a massive battle, but with Vader in control, he could reduce the risk of an Imperial loss for good. After all of his luck, it finally ran out here at Endor, and if it wasn't for Vader, the Empire would be licking his wounds in a defeated retreat across the galaxy. They no longer needed to fear. Emperor Vader was the leader the Empire deserved. Vader didn't care about the prospect of the rebels from Endor escaping. He did what needed to be done. He considered having the moon destroyed, but why do that when he could try and corrupt Leia in the future? Upon Vader's return to the Death Star, he'd be informed that the Emperor was dead, and he told them that he was the Emperor now. No officer would dare challenge him, and so with no one to challenge him, it was clear. The deck commander who ordered the attack on the Executor was killed for rebellious behavior. While Vader was feared across the Empire, this didn't make him a good leader. It just made him a nightmare. He ordered the crew of the Death Star to begin restructuring its fragile pieces and cover up the reactor shaft. Vader was returning to Coruscant. He had a throne to sit on. Especially with the Emperor dead, Vader knew that Imperial officers would try and take his thunder, but no one would dare cross him. Masa Meda, on the other hand, most definitely could. Though, because the Empire didn't lose over Endor, there was no reason to believe that anyone would dare challenge him. As Vader immediately saw after the victory of Endor, Imperial officers believed they could earn favorability, especially someone like Fleet Admiral Gallius Rex, who tried to refuse aid and reinforcements to Grand Admiral Rex alone. The age of Palpatine had come to an end, and it was time for a new leader to show his power, and that's exactly what Vader did. He returned to Coruscant and gathered up each of the Imperial officers and informed them where his position was. The Empire wouldn't fall. The Empire would not sacrifice resources in the Palpatine's contingency plans. They were erratic, and they would turn the collective people of the galaxy against the Empire, which would only further aid the rebellion. Vader informed different individuals to take their fleet to the planets the Alliance knew. Burn them to the ground. Doesn't matter who's there or not. Burn them to the ground. Those planets aren't filled to the brim with Imperial loyalists, so let them burn. The Rebellion couldn't sustain a long-time war, unless the Empire allowed them to catch up. If the Empire decided it would be prudent to play it nice or gather forces up in one location like they did Endor, then they could sacrifice victory when they did not need to. Vader informed a moth from the Outer Rim sectors to abandon his post to try and go and find the long-lost Grand Admiral Thrawn. Vader knew more than anyone that if Thrawn could be brought back to the forefront of the galaxy, there'd be no reason to worry about fraudulent Imperial officers. While his loyalty to the Emperor could be seen as concerning, Vader was the new Emperor. It didn't matter. Moff Gideon had no issue going out to find Thrawn, and he would readily do so. While what everything Vader was doing was micromanaging at its finest, it would really assist the Empire. If he wasn't present, Masa Meda would be crumbled under the pressure of Imperial officers. See, the Vizier of the Empire had that role because of his loyalty to Palpatine. The most people in the Empire, away from Coruscant, didn't respect him for that role. Without Palpatine or a leader above him, which was now Vader, he was no one. At least with Vader around, he could still be taken as a legitimate official, and Moss knew that, which is why when Vader returned, he became immensely loyal to him. 
Vader, on the other hand, was going to Exegol. He'd been there before. It was a test Sidious put him through after his failures at Cloud City. Vader didn't know that Sidious could have transferred his body out, but when Vader eventually arrived at Exegol, using his Wayfinder from Mustafar, he didn't find the Sith Lord. It's because he actually killed him with his lightsaber. It's not that Vader was even looking for Palpatine. He was here to claim the fleet that was left behind by Sidious. The Sith Eternal was now his, and the Final Order now belonged to him. Exegol would become his new throne world. In due time, he would take over the galaxy for good. Most of the Final Order fleet wasn't finished yet, but one of the ships was. So he took the Zyastun class star destroyer back to Coruscant. No one had ever seen this vessel before, and questions began to circulate why the weapon had a massive cannon on the bottom of it. But considering the rest of the fleet was in construction, there was no reason to redirect forces anywhere else. Vader also knew that the rebellion would go around from planet to planet like they had before their assault on Endor. If they wanted to hide, that was fine, but he would make the people suffer for it. Vader for a moment returned to Sidious' throne on Coruscant. He hadn't been there in a while, and when he arrived he found a young woman, probably still in her teens, only a couple years younger than Luke. She had long wavy red hair and seemed angry. Vader never heard or saw from this individual before and asked who she was, as she informed him that she was the Emperor's Hand, his apprentice. Before she could carry on, she dropped to the ground, dead. Vader didn't have time to try and turn someone. He wouldn't play around with the pawn of Sidious. He encountered enough of them in his time. He wasn't going to deal with any of them anymore. Vader requested that the Royal Guards remove her body and dispose of it, as he took on his new throne. The Rebellion, on the other hand, was actively avoiding conflict with the Empire. The Alliance actually had a large enough fleet to attack Imperial Recon fleets, but there was no use in doing so. It also didn't help that Vader decided against Operation Cinder and the other contingency plans, because they would have added aid to the Rebellion. If the Empire attacked its own citizens, then the people would have rallied against the Empire. But because of Vader's merciful decision, he rallied people against the Alliance after showing the Empire's effectiveness at the Battle of Endor. Leia was working with her mother's friend, Mon Mothma, and trying to figure out how they could attempt a strike on the Empire. Without a Rebel High Command anymore, they needed a new location to call home for the time being, which would have them finding sanctuary in the Outer Rim near Hypore. The Empire didn't frequent such territories anymore, and it would be a safe place to rebuild, for now. This didn't stop skirmishes from happening either, and there were a lot more hidden runs that the Rebellion could win. They attacked a couple of space stations and shipyards, but nothing was able to thwart the collective strength of the Empire. Vader also had his time to establish a new council of his most trusted Imperial officers. The reason for such a council was because Vader never trusted politicians like Palpatine did. He always had a better time with military personnel, more so during the Clone Wars, but it was still something with a bit more consistency than trusting individuals like Masameda. The only reason Vader didn't straight up kill Masameda was because he would be able to uphold the basic processes on Coruscant, so he didn't have to. This did make Maz apologize profusely, but Vader didn't care. He was just a rabid cur in Vader's eyes. He could be manipulated whenever he felt. Vader also showed no interest in continuing Palpatine's cloning program. It wasn't worth his time. He'd rather spend his time on something else. He became more enthralled with the idea of letting the past die. It is what he was content with at this point. It was over and done with. Time to move on. The only prize he had his sights on was a potential an apprentice and his daughter. Maybe he could use her rage for him to his advantage. But who knows if Thrawn was found, and Ezra was still alive, then why not bring Ezra to the dark side? To be honest, for the new Emperor, it didn't matter. He had all the power, so he could do anything he wanted. He even considered a suit upgrade, but he would decide against it. A couple months after Endor, Vader would play a little prank on the Alliance. He was honestly getting tired of these hit-and-run tactics, so he dispatched the Zyastan class destroyer into a random location. It had a small support fleet with Torah acquaintances, and it worked like a charm. The Alliance thought they could just take down an Imperial support fleet, but no, that ended today. The Rebel fleet with two capital ships and a bunch of support craft barreled out of hyperspace. They jumped the Imperial fleet. A wing of TIE fighters exited the hangar bays to intercept and the Zyastan open fired on the Rebel flagship, ripping it to pieces with a single blast. The Rebels went into high panic, but the Arquentances pushed forward, blasting away at the Rebel capital ship. They couldn't do much, but it was enough for the Zyastan to power up again and send another blast obliterating the cruiser. The TIE fighters finished off their work, and then Inferno Squad, which was tasked with the Zyastan, was dropped off inside the wreckage to kill any survivors. It was a show of strength, and it showed the Alliance that their days were now numbered. The Rebels would learn of this loss, but they never knew what caused the destruction only that it happened. On the other hand, even though Vader had no interest in immortality, he began to fixate on the idea of creating longevity for himself. He wanted to add updated life support systems to his suit that would allow him to live longer than he would otherwise, which was a bit of an arduous task. For the first time in years, he was able to return to the back to tank and genuinely relax. 
Vader's ability to relax and take time inside the Bacta tank was a pleasure he got from being Emperor. No one could tell him he couldn't. Plus, Vader threw away the original Royal Guard and replaced them with a much more loyal Praetorian Guard. The reason for this is the Royal Guard went through all their training to protect Palpatine and do his bidding. There could be a loose end amongst the ranks. So he needed a new group of guards that he could trust and be positive about trusting. The Praetorians donned new armor and they resembled that of the Mandalorian's armor, which didn't really bug Vader. He had plans to enhance their designs anyways. For another year, the fight between the Alliance and the Empire would continue. At this point, the second Death Star was completely finished, but it was left on the indoor system. Truthfully, Vader didn't care for it, but because it was already being worked on, why not have it finished? He'd much rather use the Zystons because they were much easier to maneuver. But that fleet had a lot more time to build. Without a true opponent in the force, Vader felt kind of bored. I mean, in his opinion, it was nice to not serve anyone, but there was no competition. The only potential was Leia, which he was fully unaware at this point had given birth to her son, Ben Solo. They didn't get married on Endor, but they did elsewhere after the terrible loss. They continued being generals for the Alliance, and Leia, similarly to how Hera did, continued fighting the good fight until physically unable to. The rebels were trying to turn planets against the Empire, and it was kind of working, but after Vader's henchmen went to worlds like Lethal and burned them to the ground, leaving no survivors, there was no point and continuing to fight against the Empire. Vader instead decided to put a hit out on the former captain of the Millennium Falcon. He brought Inferno Squad away from the head hunting and sent them out to find Han Solo and kill him. If the Wookiee was there, kill him too. At this moment, Inferno Squad had its newest member. All the members were especially skilled, but an Imperial sharpshooter by the name of Miggs Mayfield was given a chance to excel through the ranks and was placed in Inferno Squad as their official sharpshooter. They'd be out of contact with anyone for months, but they would eventually find the Rebellion on Dakar where they would report their location before following Han, Chewie, and the Lasat rebel Seth Aurelius in Lando Calrissian's former vessel called Lady Luck off-world. They were going off-world to try and gain information on the Kuat drive guards. It would be their last mission ever. Inferno Squad would track the rebels to the city on the ground of Kuat. Migs followed Han while Aiden tracked Chewie, and the other two followed Zeb. With a single shot, Han Solo would be dropped on the city streets of Kuat. The other two would be hunted and killed like big game before Inferno Squad left to regroup with their personal Zystan destroyer. The Empire prepared to destroy the fleet of the Rebellion. Inferno Squad was stealthy about their approach to Dakar, but the entire Alliance fleet was stationed there. It was a great spot, and aside from Inferno Squad, there were thousands of Imperial scouts looking for the Rebels. Inferno just happened to be the one to find them. Because of the large threat here, Vader placed Grand Admiral Rey Sloan in charge of the Imperial fleet. She of course took her flagship, and Exegol deployed two more Zystan class destroyers. The Imperial fleet that was being sent to Dakar was being sent with one mission, obliterate the Alliance once and for all. Vader had the same feeling as well. He wanted to destroy the Alliance. If he could take Leia in, then he would. If not, so be it. When the Empire arrived, the rebels quickly evacuated his leadership. Mon Mothma and Leia and Ben Solo were sent out on Captain Haldo's corvette as the Imperial fleet arrived. They were able to jump the hyperspace before Admiral Salone deployed two interdictors. The rebel fleet command was inside of the Radis, the current capital ship of the planet. The base on the ground prepared to attack the Empire, but Salone deployed the first Zystun and it fired a blast that incinerated the entire planet, killing Harris and Dula and Commander Rex in the process. The rebels saw what terror they had just witnessed. Their base was destroyed and they had to fight, but there was no fight to be had. The other two Zystun destroyers targeted the largest vessels, including the Radis, and obliterated them both. The Alliance fleet descended into chaos, and Vader watched from the bridge of his personal Zystan class destroyer. He enjoyed the terror he felt of the Force. Admiral Salone felt no need to use the Zystons for their super cannons and allowed the fleet to fleet combat to ensue. The Zystons released waves of tied daggers, while interceptors and fighters followed them into combat against the fragile rebel cell. Their entire force was lost. The battle dragged out for a grueling hour, but it finally came to an end. The Empire barely suffered a dent, and the Alliance with nothing but shambles. Vader left his eyes on and took a Lambda shuttle to Tangilia. He could feel through the force that Leia had survived, so he would go and find her. He knew where they would go. It was Mon Mothma's last attempt at rebuilding anything. Her alliance was destroyed. She, Leia, and Holda were all that remained of the Rebellion. Vader sent a transmission to have the spaceports locked down once they arrived. Capture them, but do not harm them. It was understood. They got the Trangilia an hour before Vader did. They were apprehended about a minute after landing. Mon was fearful of this, but they had nowhere else to go. They couldn't hide forever, and they needed allies. When Vader eventually arrived, he felt something different within the Force. That's odd. Maybe Leia had been practicing. 
As Vader entered the complex, he was trailed by a duo of Praetorian guard. He told them to wait where they were, and as he entered the facility, he saw Mon Mothma face to face for the first time since the Clone Wars. He would take pleasure in killing her, lifting his fingers ever so slightly and ripping her life away from her as she levitated off the floor. Vader looked to his daughter and told her that she had a choice, join him or her friend and her would die. Mon shook her head, pleading that she resist. Leia did. She resisted. She spat on Vader, which she didn't like, so he snapped Mon's neck and she dropped to the ground. He towered over his daughter. She was scared and angry. Then Vader noticed something. His head turned and he saw a child. He felt an immediate connection to the boy. Vader looked at his daughter and twisted her neck before even allowing her to say a word. Walking over to the child, he picked him up and took the boy back to his vessel. Ben Solo would become his pupil. Why waste time in trying to corrupt the incorruptible when he could raise his own flesh and blood to become his own apprentice? He didn't need to know Ben's name to know that he was related to him. No worries, little Ben. Grandpa Vader would make it all right. Ben was much older than an infant anyways, so it would make everything much easier for him to get through. When Vader returned to Coruscant, he was informed that Thrawn had returned, but there was no need for him anymore. Vader was joyed to have a trusted admiral back alongside the current leader of the Imperial Navy operations in Rey alone. Her job at Dakar earned her the highest rank in the Imperial Navy, something Thrawn would have to live with. Vader requested they move into the Outer Rim and begin their work, tear down the established crime lords, rebuild the Empire, slaughter the slavers and place Imperial facilities in their place. Any sign of rebellion would be washed away from the galaxy. For years, there would be no challenge to Vader or his young boy, Kylo. The two of them would be a powerful duo, and Ochi, Palpatine's original Sith hunter, eventually revealed himself to Vader after years of hiding. Vader almost killed Palpatine's old Sith hunter, but Vader assumed there would be use for him. Vader remembered the last time he saw Ochi, which was during his first trip to Exegol. He then thought about the fact that Palpatine could have had clones released into the galaxy. After a deep dive, Vader found out that there was. The clone was tracked down and killed. His name was Dathan, and his wife's name was Miramar. They had a child, and the child was something not even Vader believed to be possible, related to his former master. In a bit of fear, he almost had the child killed, but even he knew that wouldn't be worth his time. There was something special about this child. Then he realized that Rey and Kylo were created as a response to his strength in the Force. If he killed her and him, then the Force would only make something stronger or more powerful. Rey was a part of a dyad, which Vader saw a perk in. He wouldn't kill the children, however, he would use their dyad to restore him back to his old body, though he would make sure that both the children understood that he wasn't hurting them. Vader knew this would take time. He had all the time in the galaxy. He was the Emperor. Over the next two decades, when both Rey and Kylo were in their adulthood, Vader would steal pieces of their essence without killing or hurting them to restore his own body. They were the most powerful duo the galaxy had ever seen, and they had just restored the Chosen One to the most potential power he could ever have, which the timing couldn't have been any more perfect. A week after Vader shredded the armor of Darth Vader, he ran into an old face, someone who had been actively hunting him for decades, someone who couldn't believe who he had become. It was none other than Ahsoka Tano. She survived, somehow, and she had been searching for allies, trying to rebuild anything, but everything and everyone she knew was gone. The ghost crew slaughtered, the clones all dead. There was no Jedi. Cal Kestis and Marin were hunted down and killed by Vader's Praetorian Guard about a decade before. There was no room for anyone in the galaxy except for Vader. Their fight would be fearsome as anyone would imagine. Ahsoka giving her best to a man who was still trying to get down his movements. He spent 40 years inside the suit, double that the time he spent outside the suit. He was younger and vibrant again, thanks to the healing of the Dyad. Because he took his time with extracting it, he didn't just heal his old body, he healed himself to his younger form. Vader still had his metallic limbs, but he no longer needed the suit which was far greater than anything else. For Ahsoka, it was extremely painful. Fighting Vader was hard, but now she had to look into Anakin's eyes and see that Darth Vader was all that remained. He made her death painful too. He made each strike on her body more critical than the last. A cut across the thigh, and then across the abdomen. Then, just a jab that ended her life. With Kylo and Rey by his side, the future and the longevity of the Sith and the Empire was secured. Vader may have not been as cruel as Sidious, but it didn't mean he was kind. He created the legacy of the Sith that would continue on for generations. With the Jedi lost to time, and the light eradicated, there was no one left to challenge the dark side of the Force, nor the legacy of Darth Vader. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our story. And special thanks to Galvin Gaming, Tristan, Darth Revan, Pimp Daddy Bane, The Last Jedi, Apollo, Jedi Sloth, Mr. Yeet Gamer, Mad Men Studios, Anakin 003, Lemon Knight, Rex the Wolf, the man with three first names, Dark Saint 46, Baron Joshua, 
Joshua and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button if you want to support me in other ways. Go check out the Patreon. Otherwise, let's talk about this real quick Aruni. So, uh, that was pretty dark. With a story like this, obviously it has to be dark, but I wanted to give Vader some time in the spotlight. I think having Vader as an Emperor would be a little bit smarter than Palpatine. Like, not for nothing, Palpatine kind of gets by with a lot of luck, like, really a lot of luck, like, and that's not an issue, like, that's not a bad, a bad thing, but, like, bringing the Rebellion to Endor was, like, not a good idea, like, he risked everything just to defeat the Rebellion when he could have just crushed them otherwise, and so I think, I think Vader seeing that would decide against doing that, uh, decide against allowing the Empire to fall like that. So that was fun. As for the diet thing, I wanted to kind of take what was seen in Rise of Skywalker. And because like the, the, the example I give in this is Palpatine in Rise of Skywalker takes all the essence at the same time. Vader's taking it over time periodically and he has less body to work with, right? He only has a torso and like a head. So like that's all he has to work with to restore. So restoring that's not gonna be as much as restoring your entire body in the span of like a minute. So that's, that's my excuse for him de-aging during that process but it was fun to, to tie in the sequel characters to this as well as allow vader to become like this this emperor and create like a dark die in the force anyways i hope you all enjoyed love you all spread the love and always remember my friends may the force be with you